something for instance you look at it from a distance uh, you look at it sometimes slightly out of focus for instance so it just you just see the big shapes you don't see any of the detail and looking at it out of focus suggests all the possibilities turning it upside down suggests all the possibilities looking at it in the mirror so that you do turn it from left to right again that gives you a, a completely new view and possibly something which you you couldn't see if you look at it the right way around you see it if you turn it upside down or on the right or invert it uh, in somewhere or other so they, they always i mean you know they always ways of manipulating things and in a way manipulating things which trigger off oh yes a new idea which is wonderful i mean that, that's what i entertain myself doing that I'm very much influenced by a particular sort of school of uh, painters, for instance, which is which basically is, the, is the, the first half of the 20th century. And I found that the sort of language which they were using, which to some extent is based on um, Cubism and the after effects of Cubism, is something which I find sympathetic to the way in which I feel about, uh, about two-dimensional drawing or painting. I enjoyed my childhood. You know, I can still remember, so, you know, uh, my childhood in France was absolutely wonderful. My first experience with an exhibition, which was quite extraordinary, which was, was in 1937, when my father took me to an international exhibition in Paris. And I remember that very well, actually, because it, was, it made me such, a, such an impression on me. And one of the things which I do remember very much, when there was the, the German pavilion, opposite the Russian pavilion. And the German pavilion was a huge thing, very high, and with, with a German eagle at the top. And of course, the Russian pavilion was equally large and just opposite with a hammer and sickle at the top, you know. And I remember that very well. Another thing which I do remember about that particular exhibition is going into the Spanish pavilion, where, in fact, Guernica was exhibited for the first time. What I do remember seeing from the Spanish pavilion was a, a lake of mercury in a pavilion in which car engines were floating. And that was what impressed me most at that time. <laughs> I wish I could say I remember Guernica, but I don't at all. I was educated in two, in two ways. I was educated first uh, as an engineer. Um, I did a, a degree of uh, engineering degree in King's College in London. And then um, I decided that um, I would change my ideas about uh, what to do in life. And um, I decided I would become a painter. I spent a year at the Chelsea School of Art, which is a marvelous place, actually. It's absolutely marvelous because it was full of really very good artists who were teaching their part term. People like Henry Moore, for instance, teaching there in the sculpture department. Terry Richards was t teaching in the, in the, in fact, he became my tutor. Um, and he was a fabulous tutor. He was a great draftsman. And his one great idea that you had to draw and draw and draw. You know. So I, in fact, I did a fantastic amount of drawing with him. Uh, I benefited from his, uh, from his tutorship very well. After a year, I applied for a scholarship to, to study in Paris. This is the Paris of 1956 to 59. You met a fantastic variety of artists because, you know, uh, not only artists, a fantastic variety of young people. Paris was, uh, I mean, had been the center of the sort of um, Renaissance of art, so to speak, isn't it, in the, in the first half of the 20th century. So anyway, I came back to England, and that's um, when I started my English life, in a sense. This was a time 
or the angry young men, of course. I ended up in Chepstow Villas in London. Well, at that time, of course, I had, um, I had a teaching job at Watford School of Art. I enjoyed teaching because of the contact that you have with people like much younger than yourself. You can sort of, you can uh, see their progression, you can joke with them, you can... And teaching, of course, is an act. You, you're, you become an actor, in a sense, when you're teaching, you know. And I quite enjoyed the idea of, you know, having a, having a, a sort of captive audience, yeah. which you have, of course. I lost a fantastic amount of work before, before I came to Hastings through uh, accidental fire and things of that sort, which is... Uh, is uh, fire is a, a very cleansing thing, so I'm told, so therefore um, I cleansed myself of a lot of paintings. <laughs> In a strange way, in fact, I, it is, I, I feel very tragic when it, when it, when it started, when it, when it happened. Um, but in a sense, um, you know, starting in a completely new environment in this studio, for instance, uh, with, a blank, with totally blank canvases, uh, was in a sense probably a very, a very refreshing, a very new start. The idea of coming down to Hastings, um, I'd never been down to Hastings, but it was just sort of some sort of dump near on the coast somewhere there. <laughs> uh, and so I, I came with a sort of, in a sense, with a, a very apprehensive about living in Hastings, but nevertheless I did come. But very soon, in fact, very soon after I came, uh, I met uh, one or two members of the local art school. And through them, I met other people, other artists, and gradually I realized this thing is absolutely full of people doing their own thing. You get a, a title like, like uh, for instance, uh, or should we say, Ship of Fools. Now, Ship of Fools is a very symbolic sort of idea. It's extraordinarily symbolic. It's, it's applicable now. It is even better than probably it was in the, in the Middle Age. Ship of Fools suggest ideas to me straight away. And those ideas, in fact, uh, grow as I do the painting or the, paint or the drawing. Uh, you start with a few marks which suggest an idea of a ship or, or figures in, on a ship and so on and so forth. And gradually, you expand on that. Gradually, as you move, the thing suggests ideas to you. So it actually grows organically, in a sense. The original idea of the Ship of Fools, in fact, is a, is a medieval idea. Um, it's, I think the, the idea started from uh, villages or towns which were on the banks of the Rhine in Germany. Village fools were, were sort of very, very prevalent in those days. And the only way that they could get rid of them without actually sort of shooting them or, or hanging them or, was actually to put them on a, on, a, on a boat in the Rhine and let them drift away into the sea. That to me is a connect, such an extraordinary idea, and such a, such a, in a sense, uh, an unbelievably sort of cruel and uh, sort of dismissive idea about human beings. When I'm doing something like a ship of fools, I'm trying to paint it in a sort of rather foolish way. So there's an illogicality about it, so that that's part of the part of the character of the thing. This is a much more, a more complex one, in fact. There's more, I obviously there's more to see. There are two other paintings of the same subject underneath here. <laughs> so it was, it was a sort of, you know, a, uh, you get to a point where you suddenly think, God, that, that's not working at all. So I get to repaint the whole damn thing. The slight shape there coming out, which was part of the previous painting. Again, there's a bit of colour there, a bit of colour there, which part... Because the other, the other paintings were coloured paintings. They were, in fact, quite full, full of colour. This is the one where I decided that the subject demanded black and white rather than colour. I think black and white is much more dramatic in a sense because I said you get the maximum, you know, you get the maximum contrast between, between, between that and that and that and that and so on. You know, it's, got, it's got a certain sort of punch about it. <laughs> One 
the things which I quite like about it is the fact that you can that you can create ambiguity much more in black and white than you can in color. And I like the idea of ambiguity. I like the idea that uh, you don't see quite what it is to start with. And it has the various possibilities of being resolved in your mind in different ways. I think that the, the trouble is that almost anything I do, even if it's something which is a, a tragic sort of situation, it would appear that I can't do anything but have a sense of humor out of it. You know, it it's, it's just part of my nature, I guess. The idea of foolishness and clowning. In fact, I've done a, a lot of paintings on, on the subject of circuses. It's an extraordinary situation. It's a completely artificial situation in which human beings, extraordinary human beings, create extraordinary situations. And again, that is a very attractive so subject to me. Puppet is very symbolic, you know. It's a puppet is something which is totally under control by somebody else. So that it is. Uh, I mean, you can you can sort of uh, think of that as many sort of uh, human situation. I mean, I, I could be totally in control by by you, for instance, which I am at the moment. <laughs> the puppet is a completely basically is a completely inert thing. It's just an object. And then the man is actually creating out of this object a whole set of circumstances of dancing, of being hung, of being sort of activated, uh, of being contrasted to him, and so on and so forth. So it, the, 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 the two sort of work together extraordinarily well. Do you think there's parallels to jazz in that uh, way of thinking? There are aspects of jazz which are, in fact, preconceived, so to speak, and there are aspects of jazz which are spontaneous. As a musician, I wouldn't be capable of, of uh, sort of instant creativity. And I'm, I think I'm much more, um, uh, much more detached, much more, not emotional enough, possibly. The only time I can do that, actually, is when I'm, when I'm doing live drawing, or any form of drawing which I, which I intend to do very quickly so that you don't have time to, to, to think, you don't have time to evaluate the proportions or things of that sort, you just do it instinctively. Uh, and that could be, uh, could, could be compared with that, yes, could be compared with sort of, you know, of uh, creating music in, spontaneously, so to speak. I would love to be able to do something um, as a part of a team, in a sense. But on the other hand, I find it very difficult, actually. You've got very strong ideas about it yourself. You become terribly intolerant about any suggestion which is not your suggestion, in a sense, you know. <laughs>
And of course, my father was absolutely un unbelievably sort of angry about it, you know. But in fact, it, it's one of those things in life which is almost inevitable. You, you, it's almost as if you're not, you're not conscious of making a decision. You just have to do it in a strange way. The only sort of visual art, uh, which in fact I do, which doesn't involve uh, just that sort of physical enjoyment, is printmaking. But then there's a, that's a different, in a sense, I mean, printmaking is a bit more like clockmaking because you go through a certain amount of techniques about it and you have to be fairly, fairly precise about the time that you know that you use that particular source, that particular sort of function and so on and so forth. So there is, in a sense, you could say that uh, printmaking is much more related to engineering than painting is to engineering. <laughs> When I was making clocks, it was a winter activity um, because I've always had the uh, the studio which I have at the moment, which is uh, cold in the winter. Therefore, I can't work in the winter. Therefore, I used to work in a smaller room and make clocks. The funny thing about clocks, especially long case clocks, uh, commonly known as grandfather clocks, long case clocks have uh, got the sort of almost the, the proportions of a human being. A strange way, they're, they're somewhere between sort of you know five and a half and six and a half feet tall. Most of them, they are in a sense sculptural, in the sense that if you design the case uh, to be, in fact, a, a form of sculpture, you, you design it to to have certain proportions and to have set, and you you use certain types of veneers for the clock and, uh, as a finished product. So there is, there is the, that element of the sort of the visual aspect of it. The actual building of these machines means that you have uh, that you have to be very very precise in what you're doing depending on the sort of complexity of the clock that you that you're making uh, the time can be um, from starting on paper to actually doing the finished job uh, can take you as long as four years for instance four four winters should we say Partly one of the reasons I gave up making clocks is that, you know, as you get older, you're not terribly keen on taking things which are doing things which are going to take four years to make. <laughs> I used the small pieces of sculptures which I'd made two or three years previously, um, and seeing how they came out in terms of, 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 of uh, videos, um, and then I thought of ways of actually making them move. With shadows, for instance, you know, and moving shadows and so on and so forth, which, are, which again is another fascinating aspect of uh, of uh, playing with videos and creating you know, uh, things like turntables, for instance, you know, turntables which you can vary the speed of. There's one in which they actually fall off the edge. You know, they, I put them in a, in a certain way, and they, they gradually start moving. They, 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 they all fall off the edge, you know, which is great actually, because if you reverse that, you know, in the computer, then they come up, you know, and and create themselves in, a, in an ordered way. You're actually reversing time, which is which is quite a concept when you think about it. Gradually, I built up a, a form of animation, if you like. I think most people. <laughs> Most people who are sort of video people who do animation um, find it very difficult to accept the fact that what I'm doing is animation. And uh, so I have very little success with them, I'm afraid. I couldn't do what I'm doing now without engineering, strangely enough, you know, because it does give you an element of, uh, of structure, of logic, of shape, of form. Nowadays, you know, if you exhibit a, uh, the casing of a transformer, you probably sort of, you know, hailed as one of the great innovators. <laughs> art, you are much more influenced by other people than you are in, in engineering. Because there are so many great artists of the past 
Uh, and you're obviously, you're aware of them, you're aware of them in books, you're aware of them in, in, in exhibitions and so on and so forth. Uh, and if even if they are sort of contemporary, you're even aware of them as individuals. When people say, you know, um, uh, how's your work getting on? I, I tell them, I'm not working, I'm playing. You know, that, that's all I'm going to it's play. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's the best way to do, to think about it, actually. Because, in fact, it, uh, play leaves you a terrific sort of freedom of expression, you know. If you, if you think, if you, otherwise, if you think uh, you, you've got a commission for it. So I've never had a commission, actually, in my life, you know. <laughs>